prayers for me this past week. I'm feeling much better. I am huggable again. And uh, thank the Lord for his strengthening. Get me over whatever that was that came upon me. Mark chapter 14. We are, we are moving close to the end of this study of this gospel account. Looking at it for now these many weeks uh, in that overarching theme that the gospel in action. I want to remind you real quickly while we, while we gave it that title uh, because of the, of the movement, the movement language. Immediately, next, then, it's just Jesus. Mark has Jesus moving to the cross, and we're, cl we're close to that now. We're in the last week of his life, uh, approaching Passover. And I want us to see today in this text that we're going to read here in a few moments how Jesus, was, as Joshua said, was constantly thinking about why he came. And he's even communicated that at this point in the gospel to, to his disciples about how the Son of Man is going to be betrayed. He's going to be handed over to the religious leaders. Then he's going to be uh, killed and rise again. And they, they just tend to dismiss it. They have argued with him about it. They've been puzzled about it. But you're going to see in this passage today a woman who understood it, who understood it and anticipated it. And it really becomes a challenge for us. You know, Lord, help us, to, help us to see Jesus the way he wants to be seen, to know him the way he wants to be known, and to, and to value him, to love and adore him the way that he wants to be. Mark chapter 14, verses 1 to 11. I hope you found uh, that passage in your Bible. I hope you have your Bible with you. If you don't have a Bible, we're going to put it on the screen for you, put the text up there so you can see it, and encourage you to... Seek us out so we can get you a Bible. You need your own copy. Stand with me if you would. Follow along in, in the scripture or on the screen as I read this text to you today. It was now two days before the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And the chief priest and the scribes were seeking how to arrest him by stealth and kill him. For they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar from the people. And while he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he was reclining at table, a woman came with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard, very costly, and she broke the flask and poured it over his head. There were some who said to themselves indignantly, why was the ointment wasted like that? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they scolded her. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She's done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you, and whenever you want, you can do good for them, but you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. And truly I say to you, whoever, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priest in order to betray him to them. And when they heard it, that is the chief priest, they were glad and promised to give him money. And he sought an opportunity to betray him. We just read together the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. Lord, help us. There's two different types of people in this passage today. The one who loves and values Jesus and the one who valued things more than Jesus who ultimately would betray him. God, help us to be the former, not the latter. Thank you. Please be seated. Well, the intensity is building. We told you he has retreated from the temple area not to return to the temple until he returns in its glory. He's gone to Bethany, just a, just a couple of miles away from Jerusalem. He's finished up his time of sitting on the Mount of Olives and talking to his disciples, answering the question they asked after he pointed out the temple and said, no two stones will be left on top of one another in this edifice. They wanted to know when there must be, and he gave them 
this incredible uh, teaching about the end time. And we've looked, at, looked through that recently. And, and now he's retreated back to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, Martha, and Mary, a brother and two sisters, where Jesus made his home, a family he loved decidedly. Lazarus had died. He had raised him back from the dead. And we're told in our text that he's hosted at a dinner uh, from one called Simon the leper. We're going to look at that in just a moment. I want you to see in this passage these things that seems to me that jump out. First of all, there's this plot to kill Jesus that intensifies. This, we're going to see in a minute. It's not the first time they've talked about it. It's just intensified. Second, this act of devotion, but, but really it's more than an act of devotion. And third, this misplaced value that's exposed in the, in the speaking out against the act of, of anointing Jesus. Then fourth, treasuring Jesus and his death. We're going to look at that, which is really what the passage uh, is about. And then fifth, the inevitable outworking of not treasuring Jesus. What happens? What, do you, what, what path do you go down when you don't treasure Jesus above all else? We're going to look at this together, okay? Let's just take a few minutes to look at First of all, this plot to kill Jesus intensifies. We're told in the text in verses 1 and 2, it was now two days before the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So the chief priests, as all good religious leaders do, are making preparation for that, that great celebration where, where multitudes would flock to Jerusalem <laughs> to celebrate Passover. No, that's not what they're doing. They're seeking how to arrest him by stealth. In other words, not arrest him in the public view, but arrest him at night when no one's around. And not arrest him so that they could try him before the people and expose him as being a fraud, but arrest him under the guise of arresting him, to cart him off, very much like the Russian KGB did in the days of communism, and by the way is still doing over in Russia, what's happening in China and on and on, where people disappear uh, the authorities come and get them, and they're never to be heard from again. That's what they were wanting to do to Jesus. Arrest him by stealth, and then kill him. And they were wise enough to know the sentiment of the people and the temperament of the people when they come for a high holy day like Passover, that they would not, should not do it during the feast, lest there be an uproar from the people. They feared and hated Jesus, and they feared the people's interest in Jesus and they did not want to turn the people against Jesus because in, in this Roman dominated setting it's the Sanhedrin the religious body and Herod the puppet king who would be held accountable by the Roman authorities if there was an, an outbreak if the people began to riot and the religious leaders knew this so here's the sad facts the religious establishment wanted to kill Jesus. They wanted to for some time. I want to just call your attention. Look back to Mark chapter 3, verse 6. This is early on in the gospel account. Jesus had healed a man's withered hand on the Sabbath, and so their response was, remember, they went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. The religious leader met, leader met with a political group. How can we destroy him? Well, it's intensified more recently. We looked at this more recently in Mark chapter 12, verse 12, when he had cleansed the temple and then taught uh, the parable of the wicked, wicked vineyard keepers, and they knew exactly who he was talking about, who he directed it at. So Mark 12, 12, they were seeking to arrest him but feared the people, for they perceived that he had told the parable against them. They left him and went away. So this has been intensifying. And now, a couple of days before Passover, here we see it coming to a feverish pitch. And they will carry it out in just a couple of days uh, with the help of one who had been with Jesus since the beginning. Second thing I want you to see is that this act of devotion. But really, it's much more than an act of devotion. Verse 3, while he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, 
He was reclining at table. A woman came with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard, very costly. She broke the flask and poured it over his head. Now, we read together, read responsibly John's Gospel, chapter 12, verses 1 to 8. I, we read that because it's a parallel passage to this. And when you weave the two together, you get, you get a pretty good picture of what was going on. So I want to read you John chapter 12, verse 3. Mary, therefore, took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. We discover some things here. There's the home of Simon the leper. We, uh, we're not real sure who Simon is. Uh, commentators conjecture that, that this is probably a man who was a leper and who'd been healed by Jesus, and now he's hosting a dinner in his honor. When you read John 12, if that's all you had, you would think that this meal took place in the home of, of Lazarus. But Lazarus and, and Martha and Mary are at the home of Simon the leper along with Jesus and, and John and Judas and, and several of the disciples, if, if not all the disciples. Just imagine what that was like. If indeed Simon was a leper, formerly a leper, had been healed by Jesus, he's, he's there as living proof of the power of Jesus. Lazarus is there, the power of Jesus not only to heal, but the power of Jesus to bring back from the dead. Martha's serving. Lazarus is reclining. Mary steps forward with an, an alabaster container of ointment. Now we read over that and don't think much of it. But when you do a little study of what she was actually doing, uh, this nard, this perfume was very expensive. Some commentators put the estimate of t if you, today's value of what she had with her there was twenty five to thirty thousand dollars worth of ointment. she comes in with an overwhelming sense of devotion. Remember, you go back to the time when Lazarus had died and the sisters were grief stricken, even to the point of wanting to rebuke Jesus of why he hadn't gotten there. If you'd gotten here sooner, Lord, our brother would not have died. And now you see overwhelming love and devotion, a treasuring of Jesus by this woman. She loved him much. She had seen him act on her behalf, on their behalf. Now just stop for a moment and ask you, has Jesus ever acted on your behalf? Would people know from watching you that you treasure him greatly, that you love him you adore him. Because that is, that's what's resonating here. When you, when you weave the John account and the Mark account together, you discover that, that she pours this on his, on his head to anoint him. She pours it on his feet, lets her hair down, and begins to wash his feet. It's, a, it's an am amazing, it's just a total disregard for what else is happening. It's almost as if she, she loses a sense of, of dinner etiquette, a dinner decorum, so captivated by the Savior. New Testament times, a woman's glory, <clears throat> a woman's hair was her glory. To let down her hair and, and wipe his feet with her hair. There's such a sense of total surrender, captivation with him. And look at the third thing going on here. You see, wouldn't you like to think that people watching that would have been not only taken aback by what she was doing, such devotion, such an outpouring of love, but also perhaps rebuked in their own hearts that they themselves did not show that kind of a, 
of a valuing and a treasuring of him? That's not what happens, though. There's this misplaced value that's exposed. But Mark's gospel tells us in verses 4 and 5, there were some who said to themselves indignantly, why was the ointment wasted like that? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And so they scolded her. From Mark's gospel, we don't know who they are. But you know from experience that they say a lot of things and do a lot of things and cause a lot of mischief. They always have. They always will, I suppose. Well, John's gospel is not as charitable. In verses 4 to 6 of chapter 12, but Judas Iscariot, John names the chief antagonist, the vocal one who was concerned about the waste of resources. Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him, goes, John just gives a little editorial comment there, said, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? And then John gives us more commentary. Judas said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. So Judas represents the opposite, the polar opposites here. Mary approaches this with abandon. almost thoughtless of value because she values Jesus Christ so much. Judas has dollar signs in his eyes. Why was this wasted? Wasted on Jesus. Can you really, can you really waste anything on Jesus? If you know who he is, can you waste time loving Jesus, fellowshipping with Jesus? Can you waste time learning about Jesus? Can you waste time ministering in the name of Jesus? Can you waste time telling others about Jesus? How is it possible to waste, to even use the word waste in conjunction with with the life of Jesus. And yet it comes out of Judas's mouth. And the Mark's gospel says there were those, so apparently Judas was joined by others in the room. You can almost hear the, hmm, well, that's right, yeah, yeah. Wow, that's a good point. Yeah. There is this clash here. Mary values Jesus more than she does her own reputation, more than she does the, the appearance of decorum, more than she does the, the comments of others, what other people think of her. Judas values other things more than Jesus. He would even take the cause of the to hide behind as his case. And brothers and sisters, we need to learn something here. Devotion to Christ is either paramount or there's devotion to other things and other people that subjugates Jesus not to a level of different value but, but in the category of waste. We live in a very busy, intense time. I want to say something to parents here. Your children, your children learn. They know what you value. They know what you value. And they will grow up either embracing your values or recoiling against them. It's typically what you see happen to children when they grow up. Be sure that you teach them that the way of Christ, the words of Christ, the gospel, 
the ministry. These are to be highly valued, highly treasured. If you don't, then you will unwittingly water down their devotion. Now, they can recover it. There's no doubt about it. The gospel can overcome parental failure, thank the Lord. <clears throat> but the real question a parent ought to have to ask is, why, why would my parental example on this matter of treasuring Christ, of loving Christ, of being devoted to him above all else, why would that ever have to be? Stress is pretty great here. Mary, Judas. You say, well, I'm not a Judas. I, I, I doubt there's a Judas here. But Mary ought to be our model. And we ought to run as far as we can away from the mentality of Judas. One commentator said this, Judas, with calculator in hand, a man, this is great, a man who knew the price of everything and the value of nothing. Instantly calculated that what she had done was a waste of resources. Now Jesus responds in a way I think that shocked the crowd. They rebuked her. They scolded her. And basically said that what she had just done to Jesus with that ex expensive ointment could have been put to better use. Well, look in the fourth place. What, how Jesus responds when someone treasures him above all else. And in this case, recognizes his death. Jesus said in verse 6, leave her alone. Think about how that must have reverberated through the room. Judas has stepped forward to scold her. Others join in. Now, back up a little bit, folks. He has just pronounced a scathing denunciation on the religious leaders. And now, with time getting short, in a public setting, he basically says to Judas and the others, back off of her. Leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? In other words, how dare you? She has done a beautiful thing to me. Let that soak in. I was reading through this this week and meditating upon it, studying, you know, and Lord, what What would you say is a beautiful thing I have done to you? Notice, he didn't say she's done a beautiful thing for me. What is a beautiful thing I have done to you? Is it apparent to those who know me, those who brush up with me, that I delight in blessing you. Is that how I'd be known? By those who know me most intimately, it's, it's, a, it's a searching question. Would my wife say that? My husband delights in blessing Jesus, in doing beautiful things to him. It's an unusual statement that he makes here. Leave her alone. Why are you troubling her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. Now, I submit to you the, the room is going definitely silent at this point. In fact, I would, I think this is a sanctified guess that probably they had delighted somewhat in the way that he went after the religious leaders for their hypocrisy, though we, we looked at that at the time, and we've got to confess that there was probably some trepidation because they knew that that was going to have consequences, negative repercussions. But there was, there was some sort of a delight that he would have the, the boldness, the temerity to just to challenge the religious leaders. But he has turned this now on his 
on those who have spent the most time with him. The Pharisees and the, and the scribes and the Sadducees, they could perhaps be, you could say, well, they didn't spend that much time with him. They didn't know him that well. You cannot say that about this crowd he's teaching now. They know him better than anyone else. And yet, do they? Do they? He goes on and says, for you, will, you always have the poor with you. Whenever you want, you can do good for them. But you will not always have me. Same thing as in John chapter 12, verses 7 to 8. Leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. He goes on in Mark's gospel, chapter, verse 8. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for my burial. And truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. What we discover here, the crux of it is, yes, yes it was an expression of devotion. Yes, she, she was placing higher value on Jesus than even on a, an expensive alabaster container of, of nard. Even more than thought, thinking about how can I, if I sold this, what could I do with it for, for ministry? Yes, all that's happening. But what you discover is that she took Jesus at his word in a way that none of the disciples did. She's anticipating his death. He has said, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed, handed over to the leadership. Mocked, beaten, put to death. Rise again. And apparently, in the inner circle of those who spent the most time with him, she may not be the only one, but she is the most obvious one who got it. Who believed it. Who took it to heart. The time with him was limited and in fact was coming to an end. It's, it's almost as if, as if she was granted a discernment to see what all these episodes were meaning, what they were leading up to. When the disciples tended to dismiss it, that they weren't going to allow that to happen. She saw it differently. She realized that there was no way it could avoid happening. That this was why Jesus came. She has done what she could. Another, another searching statement. I ask myself and I ask you, is that what Jesus would say of you and me? He did what he could. You see, that doesn't have a mount tied to it, folks. That has commitment. It's very much like the woman that gave uh, the, the tiny amount of money in the temple treasury, and he commended her. It's like Zacchaeus being gripped with who Jesus Christ is and at the same time gripped with his own sin and then beginning to make restitution. She's done what she could. Be a great epitaph on a headstone, wouldn't it? He did what he could for Jesus. And then he speaks what I think is the core of what's going on here. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. And the unspoken question there is, what, what value can you put on my death for you? Can you, can you say, well, he's going to die for us, and we need to give him a proper burial, but we don't want to go over X amount of denarii. <laughs> X amount of shekels. We don't. We, you see, what she's done with this price, this, this, this incredibly expensive perfume, is not only show 
how much she loves and adores and values Jesus, but to show the value of the death coming. I ask myself and I ask you, do you treasure Jesus' death for you that much? Because he goes ahead to say, verse 9, I say to you truly, wherever the gospel, wherever the good news is proclaimed in the whole world, What she has done will be told in memory of her. And we're doing that today, aren't we? 2,000 years later, we're doing that today. We're talking about the incredible act of devotion, commitment, and sacrifice on the part of Mary. Treasuring Jesus above all else. Showing not only value, and who he is, but value of what he was about to do, to die. See, the, the disciples would have told you that they had the mind of Jesus. They understood Jesus. Yet they find themselves in that awkward moment of this one whom they would have sworn they knew better than anyone else. They find him putting himself between them and Mary, protecting Mary from these who were going to carry on the work. The gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ living the perfect life, dying the death that you and I deserve to die. In other words, a sinless one offers himself to the ultimate judge of heaven and earth, God the Father. And he is executed. He he receives the death penalty, capital punishment for my crimes and your crimes, my sins and your sins. And he does this so that God may, rather than show wrath to us, as we, with simple childlike faith, trust in Jesus Christ's life, death, burial, and resurrection, God may show us forgiveness. And that's the gospel. It's the good news. God saves sinners. So wherever the gospel is proclaimed, here's the story. There's always stories that go with it. I would ask you, what's your gospel story? I talked to a man years ago, years and years ago, who claimed to be a believer, and I said, well, tell me your story. No, I don't have much to tell. Brothers and sisters, If you have been saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, if you've been brought from death to life, if you've been taken, snatched off the path of hell and placed onto the highway of heaven, you have much to say. Much to say. You see, I think religion teaches you to value yourself, your your good works. The gospel teaches you to value Jesus Christ above all else. As Joshua cited earlier that with him nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to your cross I cling. Naked come to you for dress. Helpless come to you for grace. Vile. That's me, vile, I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, or I die. Wherever the gospel is preached, this will be told. Across the whole world, they will know what she has done for me. Brothers and sisters, I want a witness like that. Now let's not misunderstand. Jesus is not diminishing the plight of the poor. So I want to throw this in here because I've I've actually met people in the past who take this passage and say, why do we try to help the poor? The Bible says we'll always have the poor. Try to alleviate poverty. You're on a fool's errand trying to do that. Jesus said there'll always be poverty. That's missing the point. 
Just real quick, let me read you some passages that I hope will, will bring this into perspective. Jesus loved the poor and instructed us to care for the poor. The point here is he was about to leave. That's the point. Look at these passages with me. Matthew 10, 42. Whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water because, of, because he's a disciple, truly, I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. In other words, the little one there who is so poor in need of water. I've told you before, as long as I have a memory, I pray that I never forget this, the time when, when we as a congregation several years ago, when we were just beginning to, to think about the possibility of connecting, partnering with the Haiti Collective so that we could engage the poor in Haiti with the gospel. And we did that, and we picked up money for like 50 of these uh, water filtration systems, portable water filtration systems. And I had the privilege of going down there and teaching the pastors down there and, and carrying those, uh, didn't carry them with us, we took the money to buy them down there. And seeing that little girl, when they set that five-gallon bucket up with the filtered water and the, and the hose coming out, and they took that cup and the spigot and the water came out and handed her a little cup of water. Now the plan was for her to get a sip and the other children to take sips. To well, this child, had, she began to drink and just turned it up and up and up. Her eyes, for the first time in her life, she had tasted untainted water. That's what Jesus is talking about here. Whoever gives a cup like that, he cared for the poor. James 1.27, James teaches religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction, to keep oneself unstained from the world. And, and then Matthew 25.37-40, you know this, this is the, this is the separation um, of the sheep and the goats and the righteous and the unrighteous and Verse 37, then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? Or when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them. Truly, I say to you, as, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. So don't miss the point here. Jesus is not diminishing the plight of the poor. And would have us continue to engage them with the gospel and to meet their needs. That's what we're doing in Haiti. That's why water filtration systems are important for the advance of the gospel. That's why a well being, being uh, dug on the new property in Dejun is important for the advance of the gospel. That's why, that's why 2250, a one-time investment of 2250 to buy eggs and, and chickens so that they can, that they can have a protein and available to these orphans. That's why those are important. Those are not separated from. They're not the end of it. But you meet the needs of the poor so that when the poor look at you and say, why would you do that? You say, because Jesus Christ loves me and loves you. So it's quite a scene there. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you love it if, if Judas and the and the folks who had grumbled would have repented. There's a really interesting thing that happens to a person whose heart is hardening. In fact, Paul says it in 2 Corinthians. He says one of two things happens. And it's happening today, by the way, brothers and sisters. As I preach the gospel today, there is no neutral response to the gospel. One of two things is happening even today. Either in your spiritual nostrils, the aroma of Christ is becoming sweeter to you and you are treasuring Christ more and you are loving Him more and there's being stirred up in you maybe a conviction to need to love Him more or stirring up in you a, a devotion how precious and beautiful and wonderful He is. The aroma of Christ which leads to life or Paul says the aroma, the stench of death because you, you hate being reminded of it. You take it as, as being chided. You don't want to hear it. You get tired of hearing it. If there was a way to get out of it, you would, but that's happening right now. I know it is. 
And you'd like to think that Jesus stepping in between the disciples and this woman and saying, leave her alone. Stop harassing her. What she has done is noble. She is recognized in a way that none of you will recognize. But I'm about to die. She's anticipated my death and has anointed me ahead of time for burial. Wouldn't you like to think that that encounter would have provoked a repentance? Lord, forgive me. How can I be so hard? How can I be so cold? How can I be so close to you and miss it so completely? Wouldn't you love for that to have been the response? But that's not the response, folks. It's not the response. You see, there's an inevitable outworking of not treasuring Jesus. Verse 10, Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, left the room, went to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. Judas was unhappy with what was going on. And he was willing to embarrass Mary, not concerned at all about her joy. But notice what he was willing to do also. He made the chief priests happy. This is devastating. And they were glad and promised to give him money. They knew they knew Judas. They knew the language that he speak. Money. And after that meeting, he sought an opportunity to betray him, which would come after Jesus turned Passover into communion and went out to the garden to pray. It was his opportunity to let them know you can now arrest him by stealth because there's nobody in the garden except him and his followers. Brothers and sisters, you can't be a Judas here today. I don't think there is. But I'm going to tell you something. If we do not intentionally treasure Jesus and value Jesus above all else, then we can begin to slide that direction. There is no treading water in this. There is no staying neutral in this. What do we learn? Jesus wants something beautiful. Beautiful because of how we're motivated for him. Beautiful because it comes spontaneously from the heart, from the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Just the, the willingness to just follow the lead of the Holy Spirit in your life to delight in Jesus Christ. Done for the glory of God. He wants you. And he wants me. And anything less than all of me given to him necessarily means at some point I devalue him. I have found a value greater in someone or something else. I want to plead with those here today who have not yet followed Jesus Christ, not yet committed your life to Christ. Oh, he is so lovely. He is so precious. You have to taste and see that the Lord is good. And be my prayer that you would today before you go to sleep tonight, that you would cry out to him and say, Lord Jesus, show me. I, I hear it from the preacher. I hear it from my parents. I hear it from my friends. I just, I don't, I don't see it. I don't sense it. Oh, show me. Show me your preciousness. Show me your love for me. Show me that you died for me. And rose again. Give me a love for you. And for those of us who claim to know him, oh, brothers and sisters, be careful. Constantly search and value. Do we value him? 
Do I treasure him? Do I, do I love him? And then don't fall into the snare of unwittingly standing in the way of somebody who values Jesus. Promote that, encourage that, never discourage that. Religion discourages it. Christianity and the gospel fans that flame. May we be found as people like that is my prayer. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we don't have words to express how he is lovely, altogether lovely. But we do have that hope. We have a hope and a home in heaven. We have the promise of Jesus abiding with us and his exhortation for us to abide in him. And we know that in him is fullness and joy and life and peace. So come anew and afresh today and wash us with your word, those of us who are saved, to a cleansing and a renewing and sanctification, to those who are not yet saved, Lord, to the saving of their souls, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.